Okay, good evening everybody. <coughs> Before we start discussing uh, alternative energy sources, I just wanted to finish up what we were discussing yesterday with respect to the timescales for changes in terms of those demographic changes and our energy use uh, timescale of changes. So remember a lot of the assumptions and the arguments we were discussing talked about standard of living and one of the things you must remember is that currently the standard of living that we all rely on is actually much greater than if each individual was self-sufficient because there is economy in scale in terms of energy production from large-scale facilities. And you have to remember that that economy of scale, that efficiency, is due to previous investment in capital, mainly very large power stations, as we discussed. Now, one of the things we have to remember is that, for example, a country's national income is essentially the return on that initial capital investment, power stations, etc. And typically, that would be at a rate of, say, 10% per year in terms of the national income. So we have to reinvest some of that national income in order to replace the capital, which obviously is going to wear out. And normally what we look towards in terms of a figure of reinvestment is about 10% of the income to keep essentially building new capital. So replacing it typically at about 1% per year. And a lot of countries who uh, think like that, such as some of our Scandinavian colleagues, stick rigidly to that type of policy. So that means that typically if we invest at 1%, reinvest at 1%, for example, in terms of replacing capital, you should get a complete renewal of all your capital infrastructure uh, every 100 years. That's a very simplistic um, calculation, but actually more complex socioeconomic models suggest that a renewal renewable time for this capital infrastructure is around about 60 years. So 60 years, if you think about it, is just about long enough to replace all our existing utilities before we start running into issues in terms of resource management of our existing fuel sources. So the same thing applies obviously to uh, those developing countries which are starting to raise their income to our level. And again, it's all about resources. Do we have the resource in order to make those changes sufficiently fast enough? Now, at the moment in our arguments, we've assumed that there is a limit to the rate at which we can increase fuel supply based on our very simple uh, calculation of E, some N years after 1970. We're going to assume that we can't exceed that. And we've also said that we certainly shouldn't exceed the maximum energy usage of 30 Q per year by the end of the century for reasons discussed. Now, again, those are rather arbitrary, but they seem to be fairly common sense. Uh, argument. And all of those considerations are based on our current energy increases and usages and what we think might be a limit that we can stand in terms of the contribution to atmospheric warming <coughs> and are prepared to accept. But of course CO2 emissions and their impact on climate change is actually providing a greater break on the system that we're talking about at the moment more than the 1K that we calculated. We also assume that the world population is projected to be somewhere between 8 and 16 billion by 2100, probably around 10 billion. And that implies an energy <coughs> requirement, a supply of energy needed of between, at the low end, 3 Q per year and up to 5 Q <coughs> per year. So those are sorts of numbers you should try and keep in mind in terms of the type of energy uh, usage that we're looking to try and provide by the end of the century. With no further population or standard of living change above that, we're also assuming that everything stays the same. It's not going to change at all. Of course, that might not be correct. And in order to get to that stabilization, we want the energy supply to grow as fast as possible in order to maximize economic growth in the developing world, 
and allow it to pass through those demographic transitions we talked about as quickly as possible to reach that equilibrium point. Now, we don't need to know anything about economic models in this course, but it's estimated that timescales for that type of change within all the various societies are envisaged as being longer, though only slightly, and there is those required for extensive reinvestment in infrastructure, 50 to 60 years. So we've just got about enough time to do all that before the end of the century. However, we've assumed that that transition is going to be smooth. That's by no means guaranteed. Climate, extreme weather events, societal upheavals, wars, etc. may mean that that transition will be delayed. So we have to bear that in mind in terms of looking at the ranges of possible transition timescales. In addition, we've assumed that the world's desired standard of living is that which the USA, the USA now employs, uh, now enjoys, sorry. But that isn't going to lead to equality unless the US and other countries with similar standards of living essentially don't increase their standard of living they don't increase their current energy consumption. And there's this old argument that other countries coming from behind, while we remain static, may be hard to accept by some of those countries. But it's an implicit assumption in all these arguments uh, when calculating the potential energy usage in these scenarios. So, while you're thinking about that, let's have a look at the alternative energy resources. And we're going to look at non-renewable resources, and we're going to look at uh, future implications over the next two or three lectures. Okay. Let's start out with one of the oldest, or almost the oldest, hydroelectric power. And actually that's a resource, as we'll see, that's pretty much been widely exploited, though it's still being um, adopted in the developing countries. And remember our energy budget, the cycle of energy, the natural cycle, the hydrological cycle component was about 1300 Q per year. Now, at first sight, 1300 Q per year, remember it's about 10 to the 21 joules for a Q, that looks as though it could be our salvation. It's huge. But remember, within that cycle, water has to be evaporated. That takes energy. In other words, 2260 joules per kilogram of water is required to evaporate water. Then let's imagine that uh, an air parcel without water vapour is then raised against gravity, that requires energy, before forming a cloud. So let's imagine our water vapour is raised up to a height of, say, two kilometres, and then it condenses to form cloud. How much energy does that take? Well, it's simply acceleration due to gravity times two kilometres, 20 kilojoules per kilogram, say. Then we release latent heat when it condenses, and eventually the energy is lost through precipitation back to the surface. And of course, it's that part that we want to try and make use of for hydroelectric. Remember, we can only utilize the energy release of water flowing down the world's rivers, into lakes and into, uh, into, um, into the seas. And of course, that's going to be very erratic in terms of where you can start to extract that energy. For example, across the globe, there's no point in making that kind of access to this cycle over the oceans at sea level. And indeed, making that access to it over Antarctica is also rather difficult. So let's just imagine that we ignore those two, the oceans and Antarctica, and let's make a very rough so-called top-down estimate or calculation of what we can realistically access. So if we exclude Antarctica, 24% of the planet, the world's area, is land. And of this, about 25% is at altitudes greater than, say, a kilometre. 
let's call that uplands. If we assume that, say, the average height of lowlands, where the water is going to flow down from as well, is, say, 500 metres, and uplands are 2,000 metres, then that means 18% of the world's area gives us, at most, for lowlands, 5 kilojoules per kilogram, going down to sea level, and for the uplands, 6% which of course is 20 kilojoules per kilogram as the water flows down to sea level. So in total, we've got 5 times 18% plus 20 times 6%. We've got about 2.1 kilojoules per kilogram that we can access. Remember, this is a top-down estimate. That's only 0.1% of the input cycle. Remember, we've got 2260 kilojoules per kilogram. We're down to 2.1 kilojoules per kilogram, 0.1% of the 1,300 cube per year. We're now down to 1.3 cube per year. So that's the number to keep in mind. Remember, it's a top-down estimate, which is always going to be unrealistically high in terms of efficiency access. So remember, this is a cycle we're talking about, 1,300 cube per year within that cycle. Latent heat, 2260 kilojoules per kilogram. Precipitation is what we're trying to access, but at most we can only utilize 2.1 kilojoules, uh, kilojoules per kilogram of the 2260 that goes into the evaporation, etc. So that's about 0.1%, giving approximately 1.3 Q per year. Now, because it's a top-down estimate, assuming those averages, obviously we're not going to be able to collect all of that energy. Remember, top-down represents an upper limit. So we use what's called the best estimate, sorry, the best realistic estimate, or what we call the ultimate capacity, and we'll talk more about that in later lectures when we estimate lifetimes of fossil fuels. So the ultimate capacity, or S2 as it's called, we have to obtain by surveying all the possible sites around the globe, looking at the ideal locations where we can build hydroelectric dams, etc., and then summing up based on all the characteristics of those flows, the size, etc., to actually get what we call a bottom up approach value. That's actually been done, and it actually gives us a figure of around S2, the ultimate <coughs> capacity is equal to 0 0.1 Q per year. So compare that to the top-down estimate of 1.3 Q per year. And actually around about 10%, now I think approaching 12% of that S2 is already installed worldwide. <coughs> so by comparing the top-down and uh, bottom-up estimates, we're only about an order of magnitude out. But bear in mind the top down always yields an unrealistically upper limit. However, it does give us some confidence in the bottom up result. Of course, it's much harder to calculate the bottom up result. It requires a lot more effort than what we did just then with our back of the envelope copy, uh, calculation for the top down value. But what we can say is that we're doing pretty well if we can collect 10% of one of these environmental energy resources. 10% is a good number to bear in mind. If we wanted to try and extend beyond 10-12% for that resource, that may lead to serious environmental problems. We've got intrusion into wilderness areas, displacement of local populations, alteration of local climate and effects on downstream river flows on which other aspects of the uh, economy as well as the um, ecologies may depend upon. And if you're interested, look at one of the biggest recent hydroelectric uh, projects, the so-called Chinese Three Rivers project, to actually see some of the difficulty of creating such a large-scale scheme entails. Okay, what about wind power? Well, we'll spend a bit of time on this because it turns out that the UK is pretty well placed for wind power. So there's been a lot of work on that, particularly in the UK, Denmark, Germany. So how do we extract energy from wind? 
Well, we have to use a collector, usually a turbine, with some rather large blades, and those blades rotate as the wind intersects with them. So we always tend to talk about a wind turbine with a collector area, which is just the area uh, described by the rotation of those blades, so pi r squared in that particular example there. But of course, it's trying to extract energy from wind, which has a particular energy density. And the energy density of wind is simply one half times the density of the air times the square of the wind speed. We'll do this again in a moment, just to make sure you remember that. And remember that energy density is going to be delivered instantaneously at some velocity u. So the power per unit area is a half rho u cubed. So we always talk about power delivered to the collector. So a half a rho u cubed is going to be the uh, equal to one half pi rho r squared times u cubed in this particular example for that collector. There is a bit of a subtlety in that equation in terms of how we define u cubed because it's actually the instantaneous speed, as we'll see. Problem one is, of course, we can't extract all that energy. Otherwise, the wind speed behind that collector would be zero, in which case it wouldn't work. And of course, we have various efficiencies associated with these turbines. In a lot of the calculations, people can show that you can only get a theoretical ma maximum or the efficiency of the turbine, epsilon, of about 59%. That's never really realized. There are some theoretical wind tunnel studies that can actually achieve it, but in reality you can't. The other problem is that, of course, the wind is highly variable. Most of the wind, uh, most of the power, sorry, from these collectors is actually obtained in much less windy conditions. And also we don't measure the, what this should be, is the mean of U cubed. We simply mean, uh, measure the mean of u. It turns out that, depending upon the location, the mean of u cubed is approximately two times the cube of the mean wind speed. So again, that factor needs to be taken into account. Some people do, some people don't. So the actual equation is epsilon rho a times the cube of the mean wind speed. And actually, in practice, a practical maximum for some of the bigger turbines is around about 35% when they're op operating under optimal conditions. So how might we estimate the amount of wind power that we can extract by putting one of these turbines at a particular location? Because the wind speed is going to depend on a lot of factors, the topography, the surface conditions, if the surface is very rough, forests, etc., then that will tend to reduce the wind speed, perhaps make it more uh, turbulent under certain conditions, etc. So all those factors have to be taken into account. But luckily, there are a lot of meteorological measurements across the globe made by various meteorological institutes. For example, the top left one is made at Plymouth by the UK Meteorological um, Institutes. And what you normally do is you plot the number of wind speed records with some velocity u against the mean hourly wind speed on the horizontal axis. The horizontal axis here is in knots, sorry, that's nautical miles per hour, and knot is about roughly just over half a meter per second. That's an old fashioned unit, but it's still used. And you can see you get that type of distribution. The blue line represents the mean. And what you normally do is you then basically turn that into a probability density distribution graph like the one on the right. So effectively, you normalize the wind speed records with the uh, maximum wind speed, and you plot it against a non-dimensional wind speed, u divided by u. And then what you do is you try and fit a function to it. It turns out that you can fit functions to most wind speed PDUs using what's called a Weibull distribution. Uh, you don't need to remember the Weibull distribution for this course. Just remember that it can be used and can be applied to lots of different locations. Obviously, the peak and the width are characteristic of the 
wind speed at a particular site. And it's that information that's used to actually estimate the average power that you might, or potential power that you might get out by placing a wind turbine there. However, the other thing you've got to remember is that, the wind, that these wind turbines are actually designed to operate across a range of optimal wind speeds. In fact, some of the larger ones, they don't actually start to turn until you reach what's called the cut-in speed. So below that wind speed, in this particular case of three and a half meters per second, no power is generated. Then if we look at the sort of distribution from the rival uh, um, functions for a particular site, we might put a lower and an upper uh, probability for a given power output based on these two wind speeds. And effectively, that's where we see the optimum power output from this type of turbine. You can go higher, and this is what's called the ra rated output speed, the maximum that you're going to get out of this turbine. In this particular example, it's about 14 meters per second, which is pretty high. But in order to prevent damage to the gearboxes, etc., of these turbines, you don't get any more out of them. And in fact, when you reach a very high speed to prevent further damage, you have what's called a cutout speed. So the gearbox will be disengaged. Sometimes in very sophisticated turbines, the blades will be feathered to reduce the um, the resistance to wind, try and minimize damage, so you again get zero power out. So you have to take into account this range of wind speeds, for example, and the optimum operating characteristics of the turbine to get what's called a potential power output. So we don't need just the wind speed, we need, for example, the standard deviation of the wind speed and the width of that distribution in the power distribution function. That's just another example from another location, showing the difference between a rather complex uh, urban site versus another one on top of a building in an urban site. So you can see the peak is actually somewhat higher as you might expect because the turbine, or sorry, the wind speed uh, uh, sensor is actually placed at a much higher altitude. But all these things have to be taken into account. So let's have a look at a couple of extreme examples. So these are two imaginary sites that we might consider where we might want to construct one of these wind turbines. So let's call it sites A and B. Let's imagine at site A the wind blows continuously at 10 meters per second. Hardly ever happens, but remember this is an imaginary site. So we might assume that the energy from this site would be very high compared to, say, site B. Well, let's try and say that the wind blows at 3 meters per second, below the cut-in speed for most typical wind turbines, for a third of the total time, at 25 meters per second, above the cut-out speed for most turbines, and for a third of the time, it's going to run at 10 meters per second. So we're going to get some power out during that period, which is not an unrealistic situation. So actually, the mean wind speed there would be 1 third times 3 plus 10 plus 25, 12.7 meters per second. Significantly higher than the site A, but obviously doesn't blow for as long. So the energy yield at site B would only be about a third, roughly, of that from site A. So although those examples are unrealistic, they highlight that wind speed alone is not sufficient to describe the potential power that's going to be delivered from a particular location. And so we use this label distribution to characterize the potential wind energy at a particular site. And we tend to use two parameters. One's called the label scale parameter. That's related to the mean wind speed and standard deviation. And the label shape parameter which is a measure of the width of the distribution. Now that can be applied to most, although not all, sites. And most engineers will use that to try and look at the potential for extracting wind power from a particular location. Let's just remind you again about the kinetic energy of air, because we're going to be talking a bit more about power density. So let's redo what we did before, but in a slightly different way. So there's our air, 
which is intercepting our collector, which is a circle. So one can imagine a cylinder of air moving at some velocity, in this case v. And effectively what we're going to do is calculate the kinetic energy of the air, which is just one half times the mass of that column of air times the velocity squared. The volume is just the cross-sectional area that we're collecting times the distance moved in time t at velocity v, vt. So one half rho a vt times v squared. So we get back to our previous equation, one half rho a t v cubed. Of course, we've got t in there. So the power of the wind for an area a, that is the kinetic energy passing through that area per unit time, simply half mv squared divided by t. So that gives us back to one half rho a v cubed. Now remember, the air density of air is about 1.3 kilograms per cubic meter. If, for example, we have a wind speed of 6 meters per second, then the typical power of the wind per square meter of air, in this case, we can calculate this way, 1 half rho v cubed. So let's put our density in, let's put our velocity in, assuming it is the instantaneous velocity. We get roughly 140 watts per meter squared available in terms of the density. We can't extract all that for reasons we discussed, because turbines are, are designed to operate within a given ideal wind speed range. And above that and below those two wind speeds we talked about, they cut out. So we get no power. So let's, ha let's assume we have a medium-sized wind turbine with a diameter of 25 meters. It's actually quite small compared to the ones that are now being built. Let's assume that it's got a hub height of 32 meters. And typically, if you go out and measure the wind speed at that height in a particular location, the power from such a turbine you might calculate in this way. You have to have an efficiency factor. Let's assume it's a super efficient turbine, just for argument's sake, 50%. Power per unit area, half rho v cubed, times the area swept out by those blades. In this case, 25 meters is the radius. So that would give us about 35, sorry, 34 kilowatts. Is that a big number? Well, we'll see. Now, to estimate how much power is generated by a wind turbine farm, because obviously that's not a big number, so we're going to need lots of these wind turbines. So we have to build them into what we call a wind turbine farm by placing lots of them uh, together. We're going to have to decide not only how big our turbines are going to be, but also how many and how close together we can build them to extract the maximum amount of energy out of the wind. While you're thinking about that, let's just take a step up and look at the global availability of wind power. It's been estimated that about 1% of the total solar energy absorbed by the Earth is eventually converted into kinetic energy of the atmosphere. Remember, this is a, a top-down, again, estimate, so it's going to be an upper limit, unrealistically high. Let's assume that this energy is eventually dissipated uniformly over the entire surface area of the Earth. That would imply an average power source for the land area, we'll get to the ocean area in a moment, for the land area of about 3.4 times 10 to 14 watts. That's equivalent to an annual supply of energy equal to 10.2 Q, or if you like, 10,800 exajoules. That's a pretty big number, but of course we can't access all that. It's actually 22 times the current global annual consumption of commercial energy. Now, as we said, wind energy is not going to be distributed over the Earth uh, equally. There are going to be large regional patterns particularly as we move from the equatorial regions, north and south, outside the Hadley cell. And of course, we also said it depends on the underlying surface. Are we moving the air over the ocean, which is very frictionless, almost, or over grassland, or over forests, or are there lots of hills in the way? That's all going to influence the wind speed and also the distribution of the wind speed. But somebody has sat down and they've actually looked at this and if they take all these various issues into account in terms of the different land types and the topography, then you can actually get a graph out which gives you a more realistic 
the view of what the potential wind energy is across the globe. And that's what it looks like. And you can see, obviously, the high northern hemispheres is where we tend to see the highest potential for wind-generated electricity. Remember, this is over land, so what we call onshore. We'll get to offshore in a moment. But look at those numbers. We're talking about zero to about seven watts per meter squared. That means we need either a lot of wind turbines <coughs> and or we need a lot of area because that's not a very large wind power density if you think about it. Um, we won't talk very much about this, but this is another estimate of the wind energy. They use picowatt hours in this particular example that might be available across all these different regions of the planet. And you see again the northern hemisphere dominates. The one below is basically the um, estimated um, access currently uh, to those to that wind source, <coughs> wind energy source. But try and remember the diagram with the watts per meter squared, because the energy density, or rather, I should say, the power density, is what is key to determining whether or not these wind farms are going to be economically viable. Okay, now, another problem we mentioned was, well, how close, or how many of these turbines do we need, and how close can we put, uh, build them together? Unfortunately, you can't build them too close together because they start interfering with each other, and that interferes and decreases their efficiency. And as a rule of thumb, our engineer friends will tell us that you can't really build them closer than five to ten times the diameter of their blades without losing significant power. Well, let's assume that we can build them with a distance between, let's say, five times the blade diameter, as shown in this little diagram here. So all these little squares represent the area we're allowed per wind turbine. So at that spacing, the power that the wind turbines generate, we simply take the power per turbine, divide by the land area per, tur per, per turbine, and using the previous example of 140 watts per meter squared, we end up multiplying by this area, which is 0 0.016, we get to 2.2 watts per meter squared, which is similar to that previous graph we showed where we went from 0 to 7 watts per meter squared. 2.2 watts per meter squared. That's a pretty small power density. So we need a lot of area. Let's use a couple of examples where we might think about putting some turbines up to see whether or not it's going to be useful or whether or not it's actually practical. If you're interested in long-term meteorological measurements, we operate a, the so-called Whitworth Atmospheric Observatory on top of the George Kenyon building, and you can access the data in real time and download the data if you want from that website. But let's look at some of the data from last year, say. The average wind speed might be, over several months, about four and a half meters per second on top of that building. Again, let's use density of air 1.3 kilograms per cubic meter. So the power per unit meter, if we assume a 35% efficiency for our turbine, which is a bit more realistic, 41 watts per meter squared. Is that big? Is it useful? Well, let's go to another location in the UK where one of the first um, power, uh, wind turbines were built. This is at Burger Hill in the Orkney Islands. We say Burger Hill, it's not really a hill because the island's pretty flat, but the locals call it a hill. And because it's very exposed, the average wind speed is usually pretty high. Over the same period, it was about 13 meters per second or so. So again, assuming 35% efficiency, we get a power per unit area of about 1.1 kilowatts per meter squared, so much better. So if we were to put a wind turbine on Burger Hill in the Orkney Islands, let's assume it's got blades 30 meters long. The swept area is about 2,800 meters squared, so the total power is looking to be of quite a respectable 3.1 megawatts. The same installation placed on the building here, on the George Kenyon building, would have only a power output of about 114 kilowatts, much less. Put those numbers into context. 
Let's take a relatively small gas-fired power station of, say, 2,000 megawatts capacity. <coughs> to replace that, we would need 650 of the machines that we installed in Orkney. For Manchester, we'd need 17,500 of them to replace such a gas turbine power station. The question is, is that practical? So we have to consider using that power density of these wind farms, the area that these wind farms are going to take up. As we said, we can only place them between 5 and 10 diameters apart because of interference from each other. Interference can also damage the gearboxes and reduce the lifetime of the turbines, increasing the maintenance cycle. So, in the previous example, with our 30 metre blades, well, we're going to occupy about 0.6 kilometres squared, if we use five diameters. So, siting these turbines in Orkney would require, well, let's calculate the power density, 3.1 divided by 0.6 squared, 8.6 megawatts per square kilometre. Let's assume we want to replace a big power station, a useful power station of say 2 gigawatts, then that would require 230 square kilometres, 15 by 15 kilometres. It's a big area, but there are reasons why it could be done up in Orkney, if the locals don't object too much. Then of course we've got Manchester. Our power density goes down to 0.3 megawatts per square kilometres. So to replace a 2 gigawatt power station, we need an area of eight, 81 times 81 kilometres, which is not practical. However, it has been argued that other activities can take place within and under all these big wind turbines. And if you're interested, there's a TED lecture where they're arguing the, benefit, the, the benefits of nuclear versus renewable, where they actually argue that wind turbines can actually be placed in such locations. But most of those locations they're discussing are actually in the United States where land area is not generally a problem. Now for a large scale facility, our figure of 9 megawatts per kilometre squared, we round up our 8.6, is rather optimistic. In reality, when you actually look at these wind turbines being operated in farms, you typically get about 20% of that out, say 1.4 megawatts per square kilometre. That's much more usual. Well, we could perhaps move some of our wind turbines up onto the hills surrounding Manchester. In fact, if you go up to Home Moss, which is on the Pennine Ridge east of Manchester, there are wind turbines up there. So there's a small wind farm, and they're similar size to the ones we just discussed, uh, um, putting in to the Orkney site. If we take 35% of the efficiency, the time series of the delivered power can also be calculated and plotted. Now there is actually another meteorological station up there that we operate, again you can find it there. And so let's take a few months of data, so the black dots show the hourly wind speed over several months, shown there, and we can calculate, assuming a turbine of about 30 meters with 35% efficiency, we can calculate the power output as a function of time as well, that's the red trace. So that's the power produced per unit in megawatts. The total electrical power needed, however, by people here in Manchester, varies not according to the wind, but based on what we're doing on daily, weekly, and seasonal cycles. And those cycles are not matched to what the wind speed is doing. So if you actually calculate that and compare it with the power output from those wind farms, you can really only get about 20%, as we mentioned, of the average electrical power generated used to be of, of, of use to us. You can increase that, and that's what people are looking at, but you need to then think about battery storage. So you need relatively short-term storage of electricity using large-scale battery farms. Okay, so sites for wind farms, I doubt we'll be able to build that many wind turbines in Manchester. There are one or two on a couple of buildings. So a good wind farm site requires the average local wind speed to be high. 
fairly constant. Those are generally exposed sites in wilderness areas. And a few years ago, when people started suggesting building these wind farms, and it was discussed at length, I say a few years, about 15 years ago actually, there was a lot of discussion about their impacts, their intrusion to the countryside. If you actually stand next to these turbines, they're actually quite noisy. People living by didn't like it. They also didn't like the fact that they interfered with their television reception. And some people regarded them as unsightly, although nowadays you can quite happily see cows grazing under them without any problem. Other little issues like, for example, due to the increase the turbulence behind these turbines, it tended to lead to uh, an increase in water evaporation from the surface, which caused problems with plant growth, etc. So all these things have to be taken into account. So, pretty much because the UK is the way it is, anywhere you want to build wind turbines, there's likely to be local opposition, unless they're on tops of hills, which actually turn out to be a good place because the wind speeds are generally higher. However, what the UK is now looking at and has been expanding over the last five years or so is implementation of what we call offshore wind turbines. And those are actually quite ideal because wind speeds over the oceans are generally higher, more consistent. Ideally, they would have to be away from shipping lanes. And in fact, there was a survey done way back in 1985 that actually using meteorological data, pinpointed <coughs> all the likely locations around the UK where wind farms could actually be located. Now, the engineering difficulty here is that, of course, you can't build these things in very deep waters. But luckily, the UK is very well placed because it's got extensive shallow waters around its coast. But, based on that survey, they basically were able to estimate that the likely power produced by wind, uh, offshore wind farms could be as much as was currently supplied at the time through the uh, electrical grid for the UK, maximum. Now if we switch to the United States, they don't have to worry about offshore because they've got huge amounts of land, so their land-based systems can do much better than the Europeans. For example, in the Midwest states of the US, they've got huge potential to generate more electrical power than they actually consume over an entire year, very easily. For example, if you look at the state of South Dakota, that could actually produce up to one third of the entire United States electrical energy needs. And hardly anybody lives in South Dakota, or so they tell us. So let's estimate the potential of onshore land-based wind in the United Kingdom and compare it to offshore. We're going to multiply the average power per unit land area of a wind farm by the area per person in the UK. So let's see if we can come up with the numbers for that. So what we're trying to do is calculate the power per person that's available. So we take the wind power per unit area, which we've already discussed, and we're going to multiply by the area per person. Does anybody know what the area per person is? Well, it turns out the UK population density is around about 250 people per square kilometre, or about 4,000 square metres per person. I know it doesn't seem that like that in, in Manchester, but that's an average, remember. And this is a thought experiment. Let's assume the typical wind speed is 6 metres per second. The power per unit area of a wind farm, we said, was around about 2 watts per metre squared. So the wind delivers 2 watts per metre squared times 4,000 metres per person, 8,000 watts per person. So if we were to build these turbines across the entire country, then that would give us 200 kilowatt hours per day per person. Sounds quite good. Realistically, we can't build them everywhere. We want to basically build them in the 10% of the windiest areas, such as on hills and uh, little used areas. So we're down to about, say, a tenth of that, 20 kilowatt hours per day per person. Is that a useful number? Well, just to put that into context, your motor car requires an average of about 40 kilowatt hours per day per person to operate. But people pushed on, 
And this was an estimate made in 2002. And this identifies all the various locations around the UK where such wind farms could be built. 81 projects of potential for supplying 560 megawatts. That could heat, or sorry, provide electricity to about 365,000 homes. It also has the added uh, benefit of reducing CO2 emissions if we convert that uh, those megawatts into um, CO2 emissions based on fuel masses, etc., which we mentioned previously. It would also reduce pollutants such as sulfur dioxide and oxide of nitrogen. So this little graph over here shows the situation in 2002, where the UK had effectively installed about 550-odd megawatts of power. And remember, this is rated capacity. We'll never quite reach that, obviously. But that's the potential. Other countries followed suit, of course. Uh, Denmark is one of the big players, or was one of the big players, in terms of designing wind turbines. Germany, very big as well, around about 12,000, of course, Spain and Italy as well. And in fact, the UK was around about six or so in terms of the uh, amount of power installed by the end of 2002. As we said, we were around about 550 megawatts compared to, say, the leader Germany of 12,000 watts. So let's wind forward a bit to 2014, 12 years later, and you can see the wind power installed by the end of 2014, of these various numbers, I'll show you a table in a moment, they've all basically substantially increased. So there's been a relatively um, constant growth in wind power turbine farms all the way around Europe, but then you can no you notice also extending slowly into the Far East as well. And you can find all sorts of tables like this online in the various wind energy resource uh, um, online um, websites. So, for example, by the end of 2014, the European Union had installed 128,000 plus megawatts of capacity. Remember, that's capacity if everything operated at the maximum. That's what we could extract. And we're getting a little bit more now from some of these other countries as well. So obviously, economically, it was very, it was thought very useful to start to uh, generate wind power to perhaps offset fossil fuels as we go forward towards the end of the century. So, summary: by 2014, there was 128 megawatts, uh, sorry, one gigawatts of installed wind energy in the EU in 2014. That was actually split between 120 gigawatts onshore. 8 gigawatts offshore, but of course there's a lot of variation between the different countries. About just under 12 gigawatts of wind power was installed in the European Union. That was an increase of about 3.8% compared to the previous year. So the EU power sector then subsequently saw itself as moving away from fuel oil, coal and gas, or at least tried to move away from gas, not too successfully, with each of these technologies continuing to decommission coal and gas more than it installs. So the wind power capacity installed now in the European Union would typically produce about just under 300 terawatts of electricity, and that's enough to cover about 10% or so of all the European Union's current electricity consumption. Obviously that number varies from country to country depending on their installed capacity. So we'll continue with this discussion tomorrow. Uh, sorry, next week, I beg your pardon. Have a read of some of the notes uh, for next week. And we'll continue by looking at global wind energy before moving on to some of the other renewables. <coughs> okay.